We're going to be in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, as we continue our study. And my prayer is, is that your heart is prepared to defeat your demons. Mark chapter 9, we're going to start off in verse... Mark chapter 9, we're going to start off in verse 14. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there is one in the seat back pocket in front of you. Please use that Bible. And if you don't know where Mark is, just open to about, oh, maybe 75% through the entire Bible, and you will see Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you're in John, go uh, to the left. And if you're in Matthew, go to the right. You will find it, I promise, okay? And if someone is looking for it, would you just be a faithful friend and help them find the Scripture this morning? Once again, it's Mark chapter 9, a little bit different this morning. Would you mind standing as we honor God and his word as I read through Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verse 14. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, scribes disputing or arguing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. They were so stoked that Jesus showed up. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing? Same word, what are you arguing with them? And one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who is a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashing his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said, oh, faithless, keyword generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. They brought him to him, and when he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed him, or yelled, and he fell on the ground and wallowed and foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Jesus is not moved at all by the display of this demon. And he said, from childhood. And often he's thrown himself both into the fire, into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. He says to him, can you trust me? Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, he knew exactly what to say, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he'd come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to him, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Lord, today we stand to honor your word because you are great. Today we stand as soldiers to get our attention that this is not a childhood story that we learned in Sunday school but the Holy Spirit getting a message to us, defeat your demons. So would you give us the grace today to have spiritual ears to hear? In Jesus' name, would you have your seat? Unlike most of the stories in the gospel according to Mark, he gives us the longest, most detailed account of this experience. Usually Mark just runs through a story, but I'm convinced it's because Peter is the one giving this account. If you remember, Peter made a pitiful mistake on the mountain, so much so that God has to silence him and say, hear him, listen to my son. Suffering leads to glory. The cross will always come before the crown. Peter, be quiet. So what Peter does he points out the powerlessness of the other guys that are down below in such great detail to take a little bit of the attention off of his own failure. And this story, this story is a story of tragedy. It's a story of triumph. And every one of us in this room can associate with the defeat of the disciples as we battle our own demons. 
If you're a parent, you can viscerally feel the pain of this father who is desperate for his son to live and to walk in the truth. Unfortunately, like the scribes, we may have said things to others that were far from uplifting or encouraging or edifying. And when we read the argument, we've been in an argument before. This story of tragedy and triumph, it's more relatable to our own human experience than what we care to admit. Well, Luke tells us that it was the day after the transfiguration, the day when Jesus showed his glory, the very next day, Jesus brings the three disciples back down to the valley. You see, they've spent some time with Jesus. They have heard the Bible study of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. They've seen the glory of Jesus there on that mountain. On that mountain, they had a deep theological conversation about the fact that suffering leads to glory. Wow, this sounds like a worship service at Calvary Chapel, South Bay. I mean, how many of us were on a spiritual mountain listening to them sing that song? I speak Jesus over every addiction. I speak Jesus over depression. I speak Jesus. We hear that song, and it's like, whoa, something's happening in my soul. But the problem is, we're going to have to leave the heights of this worship service experience. And we are going to have to go into our valley called Monday morning. Somebody say, Amen. 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 Because ain't nobody speaking Jesus down at the port. (laughs) This mountain that Jesus spent with the disciples was only to prepare them for the valley below. Because mountains like Sunday morning and valleys like Monday morning are the truth of our faith. When Moses was speaking to the children of Israel, he said of God, this is what God said about our promised land. Listen, it's Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 11. The Bible says, but the land which you cross over to possess, it's a land of hills and valleys, mountaintops and valleys, which drinks waters from the rains of heaven. Our promised land, our Christian life is going to be filled with Sunday mornings and going to be filled with Monday mornings. But Sunday mornings prepare us for Monday mornings. In fact, Mark gives us this account so that we know how to operate in the valley below to defeat our Monday morning demons. See, Jesus, he's left nine of the disciples down in the valley. Physically, he's not with them and he's preparing them for a life of faith. You see, these nine that are down in the valley, they reveal more of the Christian life that we are living today. Jesus is not physically with us. So the Holy Spirit gives us this account for us to be able to go into our valleys. And though Jesus is not physically with us, his spirit is with us to defeat our demons. Let me tell you something, church. Demons are real. They're real. Now, you might think I'm about to do a sermon on the Lord of the Rings and the orcs and all of those things. But all Tolkien was trying to do was express that demons are real. They can possess unbelievers and they can oppress believers. You see, Jesus to the unbelieving demoniac, cast out legion. Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. They can possess unbelievers, but to the believer, listen to the oppression that Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5. It'll be on your screen. Maybe you'll write it down on your notes. Listen, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, you got one, You see, his biggest trick is for you to believe he's a red cartoon figure with horns and a pitchfork wearing red pajamas. That is his biggest trick. But we have an adversary, the devil, who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, 
He's out to oppress you. So resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings, so all Christians everywhere, are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. He's out to get all Christians. Let me tell you something about demons. They're strong. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, the word of God tells us about demons. For they are spirit of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. They're so strong, they've convinced the world that they can actually defeat God at the battle of Armageddon. They are strong, I'll never forget An African chief asked me to come down and lay hands on his daughter and pray for her. So I did. And when I prayed, laid my hands, and I said, in the name of Jesus, this woman, she spoke to me in a man's voice. No, 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 no. Not like a woman trying to go, no. This was a different voice coming out of this woman. Do you know what I did? I laid my hands on her, and I said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. I wish I could say that. I ran so fast out of the house. I was terrified. I ran so fast out of the house. The father came running after me. Where are you going? And I said, this kind requires much prayer and fasting. True story. That was 24-year-old Chet. They're powerful. That's why Jesus makes it very clear, this kind, a powerful kind, this kind only comes out with much prayer and fasting. You see, this kind, Paul lets us know, demons have ranks. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, this kind, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, there's the kinds, against the rulers, principalities, powers, rulers, there's the kinds of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. They are strong, so strong that the disciples were powerless to defeat this demon. Now, if you're a believer sitting here, you understand. Because these disciples were believers. They believed in Jesus. They had just made the confession that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. They were believers, but they lacked power. So my question is this. What demon in your life has been difficult for you to defeat? Now, you've been a Christian for a long time. But you seem powerless against this same issue, this same sin struggle. You've got a relationship with God. You've got, you're having your devotions. You have a a real relationship with God, but you lack power in this area of your life for victory. In fact, when Jesus asks the question here in Mark chapter 9, how long it penetrates our own hearts? Because it's been two years, five 10, 15, or 30 years, or maybe since your childhood, that you've wrestled with this demon? Is it anger? Is it lust? Is it resentment? Is it bitterness? Is it pride? What is your vice? The amazing thing is that these nine disciples had wrestled demons. They were demon conquerors. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 6. I want you to see this. Just go back a few pages. Matthew chapter 6. We'll pick it up in verse 13. Matthew chapter 6. These guys were demon conquerors. Only three chapters earlier. Take a look. Matthew 6 verse 13. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. You see, earlier in their faith, they had one kind of demon. But now that they've progressed in faith, there's a different kind. You see, as we grow in maturity, you'd better believe the devil grows in his attack. It's just what he does. The last thing that he wants is another ambassador of Christ on the face of this planet. You see, what happened to our disciples? 
In Mark chapter 6, they were demon conquerors. Now in Mark chapter 9, Jesus refers to them as faithless. They went from the faithful to the faithless. Church, I think it's important that we understand what was going on with these disciples. Because they'd been left behind. Jesus, he took three up on the mountain and he left these nine behind. Can you imagine the conversation? Why didn't we get to go? Why does he get to go on that mission trip? Why does Pastor Chet always say hi to that person? Doesn't he know I go to this church too? And when I go through the lobby, I'm going to let him know. I'm mad that you didn't talk to me this morning. I mean, Pastor Chet, seriously, why didn't they get to go? You see, these nine, they wanted something in life, and now they're disappointed with God. This is unfair. I feel cheated. I should have been able to go up on that mountain. I got left here behind. And what happens in the disciples is a lack of trust begins to develop because they're disappointed with God. I didn't marry that person. I didn't get that job. Jesus, I thought you spoke to me that that was going to be my wife. Do you know how many guys I've had come to me and say, the Lord spoke to me, that woman is my wife. And I'll say, no, it's the tacos you ate last night. (laughs) And the disciples are struggling with faith because they're disappointed that they didn't get to go up on that mountain. The disciples are faithless because... Well, here's what's happening. Jesus comes down from the mountain. They're arguing with the scribes. Let me tell you something about arguments. It's a work of the flesh. They are operating in their flesh. They are choosing to be fleshly. They're frustrated. They're mad. They're angry. Jesus comes down off that mountain. The crowds were stoked that Jesus showed up. The Bible says, oh, Jesus is here. And they all ran to him. Jesus, he doesn't see the crowd, he sees the argument, he sees the flesh. And he says, what are you arguing about? He deals with the fleshly moment, and the scribes and the disciples, caught in their sin, go silent. They're embarrassed, they're convicted. It's like me speaking the word, and all of a sudden, the whole room, you can hear a pin drop, because it hits you when Jesus speaks. So, the dad speaks up. There he is in the crowd. Jesus, I brought my son, and your disciples couldn't do anything. So the scribes, they started mocking your disciples. Well, (laughs) look who doesn't have power. I can't believe you're struggling with this demon. I can't believe that you're walking through this. I can't believe that you don't have power to defeat this demon. And if you don't have power, I guess Jesus doesn't have power either. Imagine where the argument went from there. You know the argument. It's when you failed and the enemy shows up in your life and he says, really? You call yourself a Christian. And instead of walking in the spirit, they gave way to the flesh. They gave way to the anger to the scribes, and they had a lack of compassion to the Father. You see, in fact, when the Father, he goes to Jesus, he says to him, can you have compassion on us? Because he wasn't experiencing any compassion from the disciples. They're more embarrassed and concerned about themselves and how the scribes are making a fool of them. They're so mad and frustrated, they're arguing with the scribes. Can you imagine the moment? There's the son with an epileptic seizure on the ground, and they're having a theological debate about the victory and power. My son needs attention, the father calls out from the crowd. I find that people that want to have, and they're just here to have theological arguments, it's because they can't defeat their own demons. It blows my mind the amount of prayer that has gone out over the Jesus revolution, and when I read the theological debates that are going on behind the heart of a movie producer that wanted to spur revival, and yet there are people arguing on TV, people arguing online, people arguing about this, and people arguing about that. 
I would rather be a part of revival and to forget the debates and the argument and choose to walk in the newness of life. See, they're not walking in the Spirit, and Jesus deals with it. And whenever we're not walking in the Spirit, He will come in our life, and He will deal with that fleshly moment. See, these disciples, they're living in fear. And let me tell you something about fear. They were living in fear, which is the water that quenches the fire of faith. Fear quenches the fire of the faith. You see, Jesus said, this kind can only come out with prayer and fasting. This kind? This kind was powerful. This kind was a stronghold. It's a stronghold like the kind of addiction. It's like the kind of sexual immorality. Like the kind of depression. And the kind for desi- a desire for power. And a kind for the desire for money. A kind for the desire for fame. This demon was strong. This demon was so bold that when Jesus came on the scene, he even tried to intimidate the Son of God by yelling, screaming at Jesus and convulsing in front of him. Imagine the moment. Like this. And Jesus goes, how long has this been happening to him? (laughs) Jesus is not moved. Jesus is not, uh, because Jesus is the authority. And when you see even this kind yelling at Jesus, imagine how terrified the disciples must have been when that kind started yelling at him. It's like when we go to deal with the stronghold in our life and it yells back at us and says, don't you touch me. This has been a part of you your whole life. Leave me alone. And it yells at us. See, this demon didn't move. This demon didn't move Jesus. Because Jesus is the authority. But the greatest issue found with the disciples is their question. They went with Jesus in a room and they begin to expose their faithless heart. They said, why can't we cast it out? Do you see the problem? We. Why can't we do it? They were relying on their own strength. I can do it. I know I can. And then you fail. They were relying on their own selves. They were relying on their previous experience. We used to be able to do it in Mark chapter 6. Why can't we do it now? I mean, I can rely on yesteryear's spirituality. Can I go dip in the oil from somebody else? You see, the oil in their lamp had run dry because they were dependent on themselves and not on the power of the Holy Spirit. They were operating in their flesh, and they were facing defeat. So the father, he's looking at all this faithlessness, and his own faith is affected. See, he believes. He believes. Take a look, if you would, in verse 24. When he addresses Jesus, he says, Lord, Lord, this father calls Jesus Lord, and only by the Spirit of God can you call Jesus Lord. He's a believer. He's even got the boldness to speak up in the crowd. Everyone else is embarrassed, and the father comes up and he goes, listen, let me tell you why they're arguing. Let me tell you what's going on. There's powerlessness happening. There's faithlessness happening. And there was no one more excited than this father. That when he saw Jesus coming down with those three disciples, he was in the crowd running with great excitement to get Jesus' attention because he's desperate. And every parent in here who is a child that's not walking in truth, you understand the pain of this father. You understand how he's trying to get to Jesus. But he's looking at this faithlessness and he begins to doubt. Because this question is, if you can do anything, He's looked at the powerlessness of the disciples. He's heard the mocking of the scribes. And he begins to doubt if he's made the right decision in coming to God. Some of us understand this. You've been struggling with your demon for years. And your situation hasn't changed. In fact, doesn't think, doesn't even seem like Things are getting better, but it seems like things are getting worse. You're looking around at other Christians, and they're living in compromise, and so you're filled with disappointment, wondering to yourself, listen, did I make a mistake? Doubt is deadly 
to faith. It's deadly to faith. And so this father, he's not given up because he's got a cause. His son needs to be delivered. And he knows Jesus can do something. He believes. So he goes to Jesus in prayer and he says to him, have compassion on us and listen to this word. Help me. While you may be wrestling with doubt, believer, choose to wrestle with Jesus in prayer. Choose to cry like this, Father, help me. Jesus, he responds to him. Can you surrender your feelings? Can you make the decision of faith? All things are possible to him who believes. Father, can you make a decision of faith? And what the Father does blows my mind because what he reveals to us today, those of us that are fighting our demons, listen, he reveals to us the secret to power. He reveals to us the secret to conquer. He reveals to us the way to victory. He shows us the way of faith. It's a humble prayer. Lord, I believe. Help me. Help my unbelief. Do you hear the humility in this father? A simple act of humility, Jesus is about to lift him up. Hey, church, can I get your attention for just a minute? We all have doubts. Let's be honest. We all have failure. We all have fleshly moments just because we're in the church. We're not perfect. Because we're in the church, we realize we're not perfect and we need a Savior. We've all had these moments of selflessness and the moments of mistakes. And in each of these moments, they have got to become a warning light on the dashboard of our life. You know the little red light that comes up that says, you need an oil change. You see, when that light comes up of failure and that light comes up of mistake and that light comes up of doubt or fleshliness, as soon as that light comes out, we need to be like this father and cry out in tears, Lord, I believe, but I'm weak right now. Help my unbelief. Our victory can be found in the place of this simple passionate prayer. Our faith is not complicated. Jesus did all the complicated hard stuff for us so that we could shout out in the midst of our weakness, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And let me tell you something about that prayer. Faith sets no limits on God's power, but is always willing to submit to his will. I believe you can heal this cancer. I believe that you can solve my husband's anger problem. I believe that you can conquer the sexual immorality in my life. I believe that you can do it. And God, I'm going to trust it is your will because I see it in your word. Listen to Jesus. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is praying to the Father a very similar prayer there in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to face his biggest trial. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible... The hour might pass from him, and he said, Abba, Father, listen to his belief. All things are possible for you. I believe. Take this cup away from me. There's the request. Now the trust, not what I will, but what you will. This is the definition of faith. It believes in the power of God and is willing to submit to the will of God. And with this mustard seed of faith, this simple prayer of the Father, a mountain is going to be moved in this man's life. Now, church, none of us should be surprised that Jesus came into this man's life at the perfect moment and said, bring him to me. Bring him to me. You see, Jesus knows when to rescue us. He knows when to restore us. He knows the right time to redeem us. And sometimes he allows us to get to the place of desperation so that we know he's the only one that can take us from this place. 
Jesus comes into this desperate father's hour for the first time in his life. He realized Jesus is my only answer. He will always respond to the passionate prayer of his people in our greatest hour of need. Look what the Spirit tells us about Jesus. It's Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Let me put this in chat language. When you are most desperate, God most shows up because we realize in that place that he is truly our only answer. The greatest act of faith that this father did was he obeyed the direction of the Lord despite his doubt and despite his despondency. When Jesus said, bring him to me, he went and he got his son and he was obedient to the word of God. This truth is the source of our spiritual power. We need to bring it to Jesus no matter how we feel. We need to bring it to Jesus no matter how we failed We need to bring it to Jesus no matter how strong the demon is, how strong the foe is. Bring it to Jesus with this simple prayer, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. The greatest failure on the part of the believer is to believe that you can do it on your own. It's a trick of the enemy. Now let me tell you something. When you come to Jesus... If you're a Christian, you know this. You need to keep in mind, the enemy don't quit. The enemy is going to put up a fight because his goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. Can you imagine what this son looked like? This son was bruised, battered, gnashing of teeth. He was probably missing teeth. There were no dentists back then. He'd thrown himself in the fire, so I'm sure there were third-degree burns, and he'd almost drowned. How many times, we don't know. This son is not a young man because this demon has been with him since childhood. This son is much older, and the father is desperate. I'm sure he's gone everywhere and tried everything. And let me tell you, this father is going to war on behalf of his child. And going to war against these strongholds has got to be a life or death mentality. I'm going in this battle and I'm not turning around. There is no turning back from me. This is life or death. And Lord, until I see your will done in this situation, I'm in the fight. I'm in the fight. Now let me tell you something about that. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. It's like me telling all of us to go on a diet tomorrow. And you are not allowed to have any sugar or carbs. As soon as I say that, our flesh goes, no! Just try it tomorrow. Go on a diet tomorrow. And until the sugar works out of the chemicals of your body, your body will be telling you, you better put a donut in me now. (laughs) You better give me some. We talked about caffeine. How many of you did a caffeine fast when I asked you to? Not a person in this room. You know why? You know why? Because flesh is powerful. Oh, praise the Lord. God bless you, brother. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. But just when all hope seems lost, the father thought his son had died. Take a look at verse 27. But Jesus. Just when all hope seems lost, but Jesus at the right time, at the right moment, but Jesus. Jesus took him by the hand, and Jesus raised this young man to walk in the newness of life. Now, let me tell you something. That's what Jesus does when you bring it to him. That's what Jesus does. He will speak directly to the demon, deaf and dumb spirit. He will speak directly to the issue in your life. He will speak directly to it because he knows exactly what to say. 
He knows exactly what needs to be defeated in your life. And right now, I guarantee by his spirit, he is bringing to your mind the demon that you can't defeat. And he is coming to you and he knows exactly what to say. He'll speak directly to that demon that needs to be defeated in your life. And you may feel like a piece of you has died. You may even feel like, don't touch that. It's been a part of me for so long. You may even yell at Jesus. You might even be mad at me. But whatever you think you're giving up will never compare to the abundant life that he has for you. As he reaches out his hand, would you just grab it? And would you trust him? Because with every death and burial of the flesh, he will reach out his hand and he will raise you to walk in the newness of life. Now the disciples are watching this whole thing. <laughs> Can you imagine? The only thing they're concerned about is themselves. Why couldn't we do it? They're watching this whole thing, and they're trying to figure out, why are we so powerless? I mean, we were Mark chapter 6, demon conquerors. What happened to our faith from Matthew 6? I mean, you were fleshly. You're arguing. It's all about you. You're selfish. You had no compassion on this poor epileptic son that's reeling around on the floor. You were more concerned about theological arguments. Jesus makes it clear with this entire experience as the backdrop, teaching them a powerful lesson of faith. This kind, verse 29, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Prayer. Prayer. Our Father taught us to depend on Jesus. We can't do it on our own. Jesus said, bring it to me. And the Father obeyed, I'll bring it. He says, this kind can only come out with prayer. The demon that you're trying to defeat in your life, you gotta depend on me. You gotta pray, bring it to me. Let me work through you. And then he said this, this kind only comes out, this stronghold in your life, it only comes out with fasting. Now let me tell you about fasting. Fasting is rough. And if you've ever done a long fast, the first three days, the first five days, it's difficult for me to even pray. I'm trying to make it through the hunger pain. I'm trying to get through the experience. I'm trying, to, and I'll tell my wife, please, be sensitive in the next few days. Because I don't want to fast in the wrong way. And we, I'm hangry. And you say, take out the garbage. And the next thing I hear is, you never do anything. Like, I mean, and that's not what she says. But when she says, take out the garbage, and I'm hangry, all I hear is, and she never says it, but what I hear is, you don't do anything. You know what I'm talking about. Your wife never says it, but you feel it. But it's only when you're hangry. It's never when you're in great relationship and there's everything going on. And so she, I say be sensitive this first three to five days because the fasting is rough and it's hard. But every time that hunger pain is there, the reason we fast is to be reminded with the hunger pain, get to Jesus. He'll sustain you. We are putting into practice that God is our sustenance, not the flesh. So Jesus said, much prayer, much fasting. And every time you feel like you need that demon, every time you feel, and then you fail, and every time the enemy comes against you, he says, let it remind you, get to me quickly. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, he would add just this phrase. So Jesus said to him, answering this same question, why couldn't we, why were we so powerless? Because of your unbelief. You had issues going on. You were operating your flesh. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, if you've got faith like this dad who says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The statement is very true. 
The humility of this father becomes the example of faith that leads us to victory. I like to hike up the Whitney Trail. We try to go once a year. And every time I'm up on that, hiking up that mountain, I will see a pine tree. And on one side is a rock, and on the other side is a rock. And when you look a little bit deeper, you will realize that when the seed of that pine cone was planted in the crevice of that rock and it began to grow, that seed bust that rock as the tree began to grow and that mountain was moved. The humble prayer of this father, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief needs to be the cry of the church to defeat our demons. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? So, Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. And as a church, we cry out. We believe that you've lit the fire of revival, and so we say, judgment begins in the house of God. Spirit of God, would you move in this place? In Jesus' name. It's Mark 9, 24. Would you say it with me? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Our challenge to change this week. Pronounce the prayer of the Father to conquer strongholds in your life and fast one day this week. Fast with me. And let's purpose to bring all of this to the Lord. Amen? Hey, I can't wait to see you out in the lobby. I love you guys.